Okay, so I'm talking about, we, talked, we were left off talking about sprues yesterday. I've had too much candy. All right, and not enough coffee. So, um, because of uh, time constraints, I'm going to have to know, condense some stuff. So, um, what can I condense here? What? Oh, yeah, I don't know what to. Sorry. Okay, we talked about uh, the head sizes and all the different kind of styles of heads. So I want to talk about, there are two different types of screws. We have the sheet metal screws. Sheet metal screws. And what else did, what are they called in aviation? All right, very good. PK screws. <laughs> PK screws. Which stands for? Whatever his name is. No. <laughs> Parker Kalon. I don't know if that's important, so I won't write it. All right, often called PK screws. And, and sheet metal screws or PK screws, um, they use a Tinnerman nut. Tinnerman nut. Not a regular thread size nut. All right, so, well, we got that one. <clears throat> yep, yep, yep. Okay. Uh, the point of that being closed is to leave it closed. No, it wasn't. I'll close the door, please. All right, you gotta leave that. Too late. Okay. Um, two styles of screws. What kind of what kind of screws are these? Machine screws is the answer I'm looking for. So what's the difference between these two? No, they're not machine screws. Why'd you say that? You're screwing me up. <laughs> they are sheet metal screws or PK screws. All right. So will this screw into a regular nut, like a 1032 nut? Or all right. A lot of lot of mechanics try. All right, a lot of men. Oh, well, welcome to the class, PK. All right, we're talking about you. We're talking about you. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> 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 yeah, what's the difference between type? What's type A, type B? What's the difference? Ask PK. <laughs> no, they're well. You might want to call it that. Just notice the end. It's one is pointy and one is not. Other than that, there's really no difference. The type B isn't the like shank almost like triangular? No, nah, no, nah, it just doesn't have a point on the end. So I know I've worked a lot of you know, junior mechanics working on aircraft. So when you are doing an annual inspection as a junior aircraft mechanic, your job is usually going to be disassembling the aircraft and opening it up for the inspector, which means you're going to be pulling, <laughs> you know, she's like, yep. So you're going to be pulling off all kinds of inspection panels. And inspection panels are going to be held on either by a machine screw or one of these PK screws. So if it's a machine screw, guess what? It's going to screw into some sort of nut, a nut plate, usually, or actual threads. If you have this type of screw, it's going to go into what I'm going to call Tinnerman nut. Uh, sometimes they're caged, sometimes they're, they're riveted in. But either way, it's going to be Tinnerman nut, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, so a lot of mechanics will say, hey, what's the difference between this and this? Because you'll get up, I mean, they just, you get a, a crazy amount of, of screws and like, well, some have blunt points, some are pointy. It doesn't matter. It's just they, the same, same function when it comes to type A, type B. But these are Tinnerman nuts. So it can have just a nut plate. I would call this a nut plate. It doesn't really, it kind of floats free. This is what we call a cage nut in automotive industry because it, uh, Later, it's, a, it's a cage nut that so actually slides onto a piece of metal, has a hole through it, so it, you don't have to go chasing it around. But both of these are going to take PK style screws or sheet metal style screws. Can you put a machine screw into that? Oh, yeah. If you try hard enough, sure can. <laughs> it's not meant to. And so you want to be careful of that. All right. Uh, what kind of screw is this then? Machine screw. Uh, if you're watching online, you can't see it. it says machine screw, but machine screw. So machine screw, is that going to go into a Tinnerman nut? No. 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 Okay, so 
what I, I just want you to notice a couple things about these screws. All right, so first of all, this is a, oops, I can fix this. No, I can't, there we go. <coughs> fix, fix as we go here. All right. Back to here. Okay, uh, Phillips truss head machine screw. So machine screw, it's gonna go into into either a nut or a nut plate. I'm going to call them nut plate. Mm -hmm. These are not structural. So these will be found holding inspection covers on. So you'll get a, either this or the PK screw holding inspection covers on. Same thing. These are just countersunk. Which is not structural. All right, but now we get into this. This is a Phillips uh, washer head alloy steel structural screw. They look different, and they also have like a grip here, an area for the grip. So notice the difference between the two. That's kind of the indicator between structural and non-structural, for me anyway, it's easy to see. As you can see these, the threads go all the way to the bottom of the head. And all of these screws are always gonna be that way. Then we get into the structural screws and you'll see that there is some sort of shank involved here that doesn't have threads. So that is going to be structural. structural. So that can be used, I've seen them used in place of some rivets sometimes. Um, things that are, in fact, structural. This is also a structural screw. How can I tell? It's, yeah, it's got a little bit of a the shank right there. That's like I said. It's just I don't know. I've never seen it written down anywhere that it's a, a must-have, but I've noticed that that's just the way they tend to work out. All right. So these are the nut plates I was talking about. Move this around so people at home can see. Although now it's very small. But there's a whole assortment. And the way these are going to work is we've got different styles. <coughs> rivet holes. So these are riveted in, and the screw is going to go through here. What's going to hold the screw into this one? Nylock. Okay, nylock nut. What holds it into this one? What's that? Oval. Oval, yep, he's right. So it's like it's pinched. <laughs> pinched, so it's a tight fit. So when the screw goes in, it actually has to deform the metal out to get the screw in. So here's a funny story to me. These are a pain in the butt. And the reason why is because these screws are actually pretty soft and they're easy to strip out. So here you have this soft screw and you are desperately trying to screw it into one of these very difficult uh, nut plates and it doesn't want to go and you're fighting it with your screwdriver and then you pretty soon you, 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 know, you stripped out the head and it's like, oh man, how many more of these do I have to do? So I was working on a plane one day and I was you know, just kind of fighting my way through it and the guy next to me was doing them at about a rate of like five to my one or even more. I mean, he's like, done! And I'm like, I'm the second one. I'm like, man, how do you do that so fast? So I got a little trick. Watch this. He gets a tap out and he taps right through it. So he just taps the middle out. So there's absolutely, hey, just like butter on a bald <coughs> monkey going in there at that point. I'm like, oh, okay then. I think that sort of defeats the purpose of the whole locking mechanism. So. How's that work for the nylon? Because he can only use it so many times. Well, he didn't care. And so it's the same thing. Oh, yeah, with the riveting in? I know. That's the problem with it. Uh, when you see stuff like this, they usually aren't in an area where you're going to be taking out every single annual. It's like put it, put it there, and that's, it's going to be there for many, many years, and you don't take it out often. Um, anyway, I like these because they slide back and forth, give you a little, little slop. All right, there's all different kinds. That was my point here to that. And my other point was, don't run a tap through it. That's not what I want you to do. Yeah. This might be a silly question, but you might used be. Word, you you, was, you <laughs> used the word um, strip. Is stripping and cross threading the same thing? Oh, okay. So what I even thought about when I use the word s stripping the screw out. Yeah. Uh, I didn't mean the threads. Mm. I meant the part where the screwdriver goes in. Uh, it, but, okay, so your, your question is stripping and cross-threading. No, it's two different things. Cross-threading almost always leads to, to stripping, but not that, you know, that kind. So, <laughs> <laughs> you st stripping out a bolt or a screw, especially, well, you'll do it a lot with the little thin nuts. It's when you tighten it so tight that it gets loose again. Then you just back it off a little bit. That's the joke. That's the, so you tighter, tighter, tighter. Oh, suddenly it's very loose because all the threads are gone. 
And then it'll usually spin around but won't come off, and then you have to fight it to get it off. So that's stripping it out. Cross-threading it is actually where you start it crooked and starts all new threads on it going sideways. You can usually get about a turn and a half on something like that, and then everything's garbage. So, all right, so that's really, I can probably end with screws there, I think. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Adele clamps. Oh, your favorite. Oh, you. My favorite. <laughs> yes, so you'll notice that that, uh, that one's actually got a, like, a hole for a number 10. This has got probably a quarter, you know, a quarter inch or 316, no, 10 is 316, so a quarter inch. So the various holes here. The thing is they, they come this way, they come sprung open, you put stuff in there, and then when you, when you bring the clamps together, the holes are off, you know, about that much. And so you have to get an ice pick and you line them up real nice, and then you pull the ice pick out and they do that again. And you can, it's hard to get the screw in there, so that's why they're no fun. But you need them in aviation. So, Adele clamps. Oh, yes, I forgot. Okay, so rib nuts. Another thing that I despise with a passion because they don't last long. And what happens, so this is, and I'll show you a video. This is the tool. So these are well, rib nuts. So as the name implies, it's a rivet slash nut. And so you drill a hole in something, like my airplane has them, where the uh, cuffs go around the landing gear because it's really hard to get the screw with the landing gear fairing is you have to go all the way inside under the seats through an inspection panel up and around to get a nut on. And it's right in the middle of a, a big panel, so they can't put little Tinnerman nuts. There's no corner to slide them on, so they put those in there. But if you're not careful, what happens is the rib nut starts to spin. And so they spin, and then you're trying to put a screw in, and the rib nut just sits there and spins all day. And they are no fun. Let me see. So well, that's how it works. But you can't tell because the picture. There we go. This will, uh, I believe, come on in a second. Well, then when you're, when you're installing it, too, if you don't have the flush enough to just start to buck, you can screw them all the way up. Oh, so yeah. So, rib nut installation. There we go. So, that's the tool. It squeezes it. <coughs> there you go. Now you got threads. And it works until it doesn't. Drill them out. Yes, because while you're trying to drill them out, they're spinning really fast. <laughs> yes, automatic deburr. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into these. These are Zeus fasteners, named after my dog. <laughs> now you know why he got his name. So, and these are usually uh, things that have to be removed quickly. Cowling. Uh, cowlings, uh, ag, ag airplanes. The entire side will come off of these things. Cam locks, uh, very similar in style, just a quarter, they, quarter turn. Quarter turn and they're done and locked in. All right. Um, I think Larry is going to cover Cherry Max in the next, next year, which is good since this doesn't want to work anyway. All right. Cherry Max are blind rivets. And I, I just want to introduce you to them a little bit. Why this is not working? Nice, we did. Please stand by. I need some standby music. <laughs> well, at least you got into unison as we went. Well, we'll just wait for this website. All right. Um, Okay, so Cherry Max are, it's a blind rivet. So you're familiar, are you familiar with pop rivets? So pop rivets, you use a tool and you basically, it's for a blind hole. You can't get to the backside to buck something. Well, pop rivets are just an aluminum non-structural rivet for, uh, we actually use them in aviation for fabric, holding fabric down and stuff. But uh, Cherry Max, one of the companies that makes quasi-structural rivets, uh, and for many years, the rule was you could use blind rivets in a spot where the loss of one or two would not appreciably affect airworthiness or something, some statement like that. But uh, the newer 4313 now says uh, you cannot use them. I think I actually have a quote. Um, 
Yep, that's the new quote. For metal repairs, the airframe, the use of blind rivets must be specifically authorized by the airframe manufacturer or approved by a representative. So you really can't use them that much anymore. Um, so back to this, let me see. So that's basically saying that you can't use AC4313 for? For using these, pretty much no. Let's see. Oh, that's it, animations, Jerry Max. <coughs> It goes very quick. <clears throat> not the loading part. That does not go quick, apparently. <laughs> so are they like self-fucking rivets? Yes, they're like self-fucking rivets. What, do I need Adobe Flash Player? Yeah. Is that, is that the problem? Have, you don't have Plug in blocked. <laughs> this is going great. Oops, there we go. So, all right, resuming. So, so are they just truly not that reliable? Is that why they're saying? I have found them to be reliable, but apparently somebody else hasn't. But then again, what happens is these things are kind of heavy. And there's also a problem with using them on flight control surfaces that have to be balanced. And flight control surfaces are a little difficult to, to do because if you ever look at how they're put together, you usually have to start at one end you start at the trailing edge and work your way to the forward edge. So the skins are actually peeled back, uh, and then you start with the trailing edge, you get a bucking bar in there and you work the whole trailing edge, and then they build it as they go towards the leading edge where it gets fatter and then you seal it up up there. And what happens is sometimes you get a little damage to the trailing edge, which is where it usually happens. So a mechanic wants to do a patch on the trailing edge of a control surface. So they get some sheet metal and put it on there and well, you can't get to the rivets to buck them. So they use Cherry Max, and so you'd see these god-awful patches with 100 Cherry Maxes on a flight control surface, and that was just a bad thing. And I think that's kind of probably what, what sort of started the whole don't do that thing. So that's what it is. All right. Um, not to spend too much time on that. And if I don't shut that off, it'll probably just keep going. All right. Where am I? Okay. So... Um, yeah, blind rivets are used under certain conditions where there is access to only one side of the structure. Typically, the characteristics of blind rivets are not as good as driven. Therefore, blind rivets are usually not used when, blind, when driven rivets can be installed. So blind rivets shall not be used, one, in fluid tight areas because they don't seal well, and two, on, oops, on <coughs> aircraft intake areas where rivet parts may be damaged or adjusted by the engine and, uh, on flight control surfaces, hinges, his brackets, flight. So, uh, pretty much in critical areas, and also that, as we discussed. Um, high lock fasteners. Let me see. Oh, yeah, I got a little a vidya for high lock. Wow. Guess he doesn't want me to watch his video. All right, you don't get to see that. All right, that brings me to torquing. So that'll cover screws. Screws and other things. <coughs> Section nine. Yeah. Probably it says recording. <coughs> Thanks for asking. Nine bolt torque. All right, for some of you, you're about to finish this section. Head off into engines, where we will be disassembling and reassembling an engine that you will run. Torquing will be critical. I will, that was, yeah, that would be critical. And I will be on you about bolt torque, and I will expect proper torque. I, as an engine mechanic, I have seen more engines destroyed by mechanics who don't know how to torque than anything else. Uh, in, in my shop, of course, people bring me an engine to overhaul, or I did a lot of prop strikes, a lot of prop strike inspections, which is a complete teardown and rebuild. And so what would happen is, you know, you bring in the engine, Disassemble it, you get down to the crankcase, and sorry to tell you, 
Mr. and Mrs. Owner, but your prop strike is going to cost you another $1,500 because the person who put your airplane to get engine together did not know what they were doing. And the crankcases were fretting. What is fretting? Did uh, Phil go over corrosion stuff? Mm. Somebody say yes. Oh, you wouldn't know. <laughs> you guys are just sitting there. Fretting corrosion. So fretting, fretting is a type of corrosion, but it's really just like the name sounds when you fret something. It's two pieces rubbing together. And so you get your crankcases start rubbing together, and what happens is metal starts to become missing from the crankcase. And then what happens is, well, leaks start to happen, and then space you have extra space. And then when you put the cylinders back on or somebody changes the cylinder, that space that is between the, uh, the crankcase halves, when you torque it back together, it squishes the bearings around the crankshaft, and then the <laughs> crankshaft turns blue and the engine quits. And so it's actually a pretty big deal. So uh, a lot of people take bolt torque just kind of, like, eh, close enough, good enough, you know, and, the, and torquing practices are pretty, pretty lax, but please don't do that. Uh, so... We must, as aircraft mechanics, we must use proper torque. We use, it's what, did, did, what separates us from the, uh, from the animals? Is that a real question? What's that? Is that a real question? Is it a real question? Was it a real question? Was it, what? Was it a real question? What separates us from the animals? It's not a question, it's a statement. A oh. question is <laughs> It's a real statement. Are you still on that application? <laughs> going to Southwest. So. Okay, this is going to be a, a, a kind of a, a meism. This is me. This is I'm put, I should put an asterisk. This is my statement. It's not out of a book. So according to Kevin here, according to Kevin. So what is hilarious is I told you I, I grew up kind of in the automotive industry and things are very different there. And so if I got caught working on a, on a car without an impact wrench, and we had all different sizes. We had the half inch, we had flutter valve impact wrenches, we had air ratchets. I mean, if I got caught working on a car without an air ratchet, I got a talking to. Why are you wasting time going like this? We have to, it's, it's production, right? I get paid by the hour, is that the thing? The shop gets paid by the hour, and the faster the car gets in and out, the more the shop made per hour, because it's already bid out. All right, so... It's always hilarious when I'm working on like an engine or something and I get somebody who comes to me like they've just found out bread comes sliced now. Did you know that they make impact wrenches and you can take apart aircraft with their bread? Okay, I say don't do that. However, I believe looking at videos and watching light coming, that's exactly what they do. <laughs> so according to me, you shouldn't use impact wrenches, but apparently light coming does. They don't care. So I say um, do not do not use impact wrenches. <coughs> Those are air wrenches, all right, impact wrenches, unless specifically called for. <coughs> called for in the manual. And the reason why is because when I'm torquing a bolt and I've got a wrench and I'm pulling the wrench and I'm doing it correctly, I'm going to apply torque and I think in the torque chart would kind of look like that until I reach the torque I want. But if I'm using an impact wrench, it is, that's the name, impacts. And it kind of looks like that until you get to the proper torque or at least it's beaten on something, hammered on something. So I don't like that. I don't want that used on my airplane. So like I said, treat other people's aircraft well it might treat it so I don't do that so yes is that is that just for assembly disassembly too you're beating on it to take it apart I just think it's a bad idea okay. bad idea I could also throw in something here about the use of cordless drill guns I got a call from the FA guy I don't know maybe it's been almost a year or so now and he uh, we had a great conversation he says hey what do you know about you know, what, is the, what do the books say about using cordless drill guns? I said, oh, I've never seen anything anywhere about the use of or you shouldn't use them. So, again, when you're the junior mechanic and you're taking apart 100 screws out of a Cessna, it's a lot easier to grab a drill gun and just hit them real quick with a drill gun and, and <coughs> put all the screws. And, um, you know, it saves time. Uh, the reason why he was calling me is because there was an incident not that long ago 
where a guy was laying underneath the aircraft, taking screws out for the inspection. I think it was his airplane he was doing one to call owner assist. And he's taking the panels off the bottom of the wing, said get inspected, and he gets to a panel and he starts, he's got his electric drill gun, he starts pulling the screws out and gets a couple out and the, the inspection plate kind of tilts a little bit and fuel starts running out. Oh. And he says, oh shoot, you know, that's, it's a wet wing. It doesn't have a bladder, it doesn't have a tank, that's part of the tank. So he's, what do you do? Fuel's coming out. You put it back, put it back in. in. So he changed the drill gun and he hit that trigger and it sparked and that was the end of his life. Yeah. Uh, so that became this conversation about, you know, are they approved, are they not approved? And I think he said that uh, it was like Snap-on was advertising an a, a aircraft cordless and he called them and it was, I, I don't think it was anything special. Um, but anyway, he did more and more research and came up with one specific tool that was actually made for an explosion-proof environment, and it was something like $15,000. Oh. <laughs> it's just some, because he's talking about it, he goes, and this is the only one made that's explosion. I'm thinking, I'm going to get that. I'm just going to be safe and get that. When he got to the price, I was like, whoa. Never will I get that. So. <laughs> I don't think I my screwdriver. Nikita makes a rivet gun like $2,000, $3,000. Cordless rivet gun. But is it explosion proof? No. That's where the conversation is right now, so thank you. Um, so anyway, I'll just leave you with that. Uh, you can do with that what you want. When I work on my, my own personal aircraft, my favorite screwdriver, I have a snap-on ratcheting screwdriver. It works this way with my wrist. I don't like using screw guns on my airplane. Not on my airplane. I don't feel like I have the control and the feel when I put the screws back in. I want to know what's happening. I want to know that it's tight. I can feel that. Yes, I know cordless <coughs> drill guns have settings and you can just hit it, you know, and then it's, but I don't know. I'm a little different. And when I'm working on my airplane, I'm not being billed by the hour or am I being told I got to hurry up. So I want to do things absolutely right. And that's exactly how I do it on my airplane. I'm not saying that if you do it a different way that you're wrong. I'm just saying that's the way I choose to do it because I can. I, should probably, I, I feel like I should mention this, too. So your experience when people are taking apart, who has experience taking apart aircraft for, for annual inspections? OK. So you take, you got, you got your Cessna 150, right? You got all your wing panels on one side of the way. So you, you go out, you take a wing panel off, you're holding four <laughs> screws or three screws. What do you do with those screws? We put them in a bag and yeah, you hang them on the bag and see if they'll roll it and put them on the ground. Put it in your pocket. So you take it and you put it in one little bag, yeah. take that little bag and you say, inspection panel, left wing, third one in. Take a photo of it. Take a photo of it. Okay. Do you use a screw gun or do you use a... Uh, I use a screw gun. Yeah. Screw it. Save time? Yeah. Okay. So, I will beat him every day of the week with my hands with, <laughs> without it. Why? Because... I don't know, what are there, 150, there's probably six to eight panels plus the wing root. Every screw is almost the same. <laughs> they don't change the screws. The only screws that are different are the wing root they're, because they're countersunk. And guess what? They're countersunk. So you know where the countersunk go? Right back in the countersunk. So that's where I save time. I've got a muffin tin and I put right wing. They all go on the right wing. Boosh. Left wing, all go on the left wing. <laughs> so there's none of this little bagging and writing and hang it. So, huh? They're all the same. Pretty much all the same. Now, they're almost all the inspection panel screws are almost all the same. They're all pretty much the same. And if they're not, you should have the intel. It, it doesn't even matter. Some of them might be PK. Some of them might be machine. Oops, they got in the same back. Do I care? No, because when I put it together, I'm going to pay attention to what I'm doing. And I'm going to grab an inspection panel and say, okay, this inspection panel is going to go here. I have three Titterman nuts, therefore I need three PK, PK screws. One, two, three PK screws. On it goes. Go to the next one. Well, this one's a little different. This one is over by the, by the, uh, by the strut. The strut has two inspection panels that are a little bit different, and some of them take a machine <coughs> screw. So guess what I'm going to do? I need one, two machine screws for this one. Pay attention to what I do. I never make the assumption that the last person did it right. I make the assumption the last person did it wrong, and I verify everything. Because it doesn't work 
you know, I'm preaching a little bit, that does not work for you to put something together wrong and use the ex excuse that. <coughs> okay, I want to say it again. I'm going to do Phil style now. The excuse that it was done right, like that before, does not work with me. So when you're putting your engine together next semester and you come to me and I, or I go to you and I say, what is this? This is wrong. You've got the nut on upside down. You forgot a washer. This is backwards. And you say, that's how it was done before. That's how it was before. I'm going to say, oh, that's okay. Right? <laughs> Who's responsible? You are. Absolutely. The buck stops right there. It never works with, that's the way I found it. I make the assumption that it was wrong, or you can, what's it, trust but verify? Trust the last person did it right, but verify that it was right? Okay, that's a, probably a nicer way to say it. Assume makes an ass out of you and me. Yeah, well, yeah. and doing it wrong makes you look stupid, Watch too. Watch out with a crank case with a hole drilled all the way through. All right, so. I'm going to bring up old news, man. So, okay, so I, I'll make that, that point. So I, I could go, that's the whole other training thing. But... Um, <laughs> I will show you guys, you guys who've had engines, I'll show them my way of doing it. When I did cars, this is, it's not a story, so don't, don't mark it. When I, so my dad taught me, brought me in the body shop, started working on cars. We would take apart a whole car, it was wrecked, and we'd take apart, you know, the fender and the hood and the bumper. That's back in the days where we had bumper jacks, because bumpers were so heavy that we actually needed a jack to get them up in place and move them forward, right? Doors out of a 1974 Caprice Classic were this long, you know? And uh, so we would take all of the bolts from the whole car and throw them in a coffee can. Boom! There was no bagging, no tagging, no identifying, nothing. Every bolt nut out of that car window, a paint can, actually not a coffee can, paint can. So one gallon can held, and if you need it, I need two or three cans, all of them. And the car would be disassembled to the point we needed to, repair it, and start putting it back together. When it came to putting it back together, you take all the bolts and you dump them out, and you line them up. Right? You guys have seen me do it. You line them up by size. So I had this size, this size, this size, this size, this size. That's how I build my engines. And when I went to Lycoming, they laughed at me because everybody was doing the little, oh, no, this is the screw for this right here. And they would write, then be careful and tag it. And I'm just like, yep, everything goes in the bucket. Boom. <laughs> and they were shaking their heads and laughing. Are you sure you're an A&P? I am like, yeah, I'm sure I'm an A&P. Well, that's not going to work well for you. And I said, I think it'll work out fine for me. And in fact, I was in a group with like me and one other guy and everybody else was like groups of four. And so it came time to put it back together. And bam, they're trying to put it back together. And I said, well, let's just sit down and put our screws together. And my partner's like, are you nuts? A little bit. And I line up all of my screw on the heads, like little soldiers. I call them, my little soldiers lined all up. So I line them all up. You know, this row is this, per this exact dimension and this height. And this is the next height and the next height. And, the and I get them all. And they're, they're frantically working. Oh, yeah, it's a, you know, we're men. We got to see if we can put the engine together faster. I'm like, oh, don't worry about them. And I get them all lined up and say, okay, here we go. So first thing is, we're going to need eight bolts. What's the, we're, we're, and the guy like, there's eight, eight exactly right here. I'm like, those are the right ones. <laughs> so you know, we, we, we start, and the engine started going faster and faster. And then we get down to the end, and they're trying to get intake pipes on. They're like, oh, my God, intake pipes. Like, intake pipes are two and an eighth inch, uh, quarter 20s. There's eight of them right here. And that's all that's left. And everybody else is like, oh, we got to start taking our crankcase back apart because we used all of our intake bolts for the crankcase and the ones that are over here are too short. <laughs> we were all done, and then it was kind of funny. So anyway, that's the way I do things. It seems a little crazy, but it does work. So let's uh, see. We use a proper, you probably don't have to write this, proper torquing procedure. We use proper torque. Um, and safety, and safety, all hardware. Almost all hardware is safety. Eh, you like the screws that go into my inspection panels and stuff like that. It's not. But otherwise, if it's a critical part, if it's um, a structural component, it better be on there, safety in some way. So safety is going to include what? Safety wire. Okay, safety wire. That was easy. Torque. Torque. <clears throat> A lock nut, castellated, castellated nuts, nuts. cotter pins. Pins. pins, thank you. Those are all procedures for safety. Torquing is not safety. Torquing is tightening correctly. Um, <laughs> torque. <laughs> torque is based on the 
bolt size. Not wrench size. The wrench size. Got that. You say you have this, but yet. <laughs> Don't look at me. I'm not looking at you. I'm looking at my screen right now. Uh, okay, so we already covered that. So example, uh, uh, four, an AN4 is what size? Four sixteenths or quarter inch. Uh, should be torqued to a maximum of 100 inch pounds. But what size wrench does it take? It takes a 7 sixteenths. So if you say, oh, 7 sixteenths, that's what I torque it to. 7 sixteenths, the max torque, maximum torque is 840. It's just 8.4 times, right? So. Inch pounds? All right. So let's see. To achieve proper torque. That's what you're worried about. Use a torque wrench. <coughs> there are many different types of torque wrenches. All right, so the questions I get all the time. In my shop, we actually had a, a business where we, we calibrated torque wrenches. I think I told you that. And the actual machine that we the actual machine that we use is the one that's sitting in our lab. They stopped doing it and put it in storage. And I said, hey, can I borrow it for infinity? And they said, yes. So that's why. <laughs> So that, that is uh, the actual machine I used when I built engines. I, tor I calibrated my torque wrench at every torque change. So I would go to the manual, and, and even though I, I knew it, and I still know it, you know, okay, that particular torque, I have to go to 150 inch pounds. I would open up the book and go 150 inch pounds, cross check, verify, set my wrench to 150 inch pounds, put the right. Um, Put the socket on it. I would walk over to my bench, you know, and click my torque <coughs> wrench a couple, two, three times. Watch the dial. Okay, I'm set at 150 inch pounds. Come to the engine and torque my engine. So I had everything set up just like that. So that's how serious I took it. Uh, there. So people. Okay. So we did our our own calibration and we calibrated outside torque wrenches. So the question is, who makes the best torque wrench? I because I built engines. I wanted at the time the best torque wrench money could buy. This is before digital. And so Snap-on made a special series of torque wrenches that was like one half the error of a standard torque wrench. So, you know, Snap-on torque wrenches come in a box, right? Well, plastic box, what color is that box? Red. Red. Mine came in gold boxes. That's how special it was. And let me tell you, it was such a piece of crap that I sent it back to the factory three times. <laughs> it was nearly worthless. It was awful. And although, Eventually, I got it to work great. Now I really like it. I still have them. But uh, so is Snap on the best? I wouldn't say that. Um, got yeah, easy payments. <laughs> Probably the same one. You just got a gold box. I know. Well, I paid for the gold box. The gold box hold ups. Anyway, uh, I the only yeah I've seen Craftsman, Snap on, Cornell, Mac. I mean, you name it. They're all fine as long as you treat them nicely. Yeah, and you uh, calibrate them when they need to be calibrated, and they're adjustable, they're fine. So I have no problem with any of them. Uh, there are some pros and cons. Well, now, if, if my father-in-law gave me a, a, a digital one. I'll bring it in when we do engines. He's, somebody gave it to him, and he gave it to me. It had never been used. I'm like, you know, and I, it was like a, I don't know, it was a cheap item. And I brought it in to check it. It is just perfectly accurate at every setting. It's insanely accurate. So, so these new digitals are pretty... Pretty nice. Um, so we have, yeah. So you would calibrate it every time you change torque setting? I would, yep. Is there a written rule about that? There's, there's an industry standard of one year. So annual reviews. Okay, so it's, um, there's nowhere in an FAR or a law that says you must calibrate your torque wrench every year. In fact, I want to say I know somebody who, <coughs> being aware of that, sent their torque wrench in and said, I want the due date two years from now. And they're like, okay. And they thought about it. Yeah, I guess we can. So there's no law, but it's an industry standard that one year is the maximum or when dropped or abused. Yeah. Yep. So when you have your torque wrench, there should be a sticker on it. Um, I don't have my coffee cup. I actually took the sticker off and put on my coffee cup. So it should have a, a last uh, calibration 
uh, date, due date, and it should come with a certificate and a correction chart because no torque wrench is perfect. So you want to have the correction chart to see where you should be. So you can adjust for that because maybe 100 inch pounds is more like 105 on yours, but the mid range is accurate. So as you get to the extremes, the torque wrench becomes less accurate. Um, styles. We have the click type. I like the click type. Uh, click type is more of my favorite because you don't have to get your face down there and read a dial and make sure you, you know, get my glasses on. I can put my glasses on. I can set it and stand in a very comfortable position and get a nice, even, steady pull. If you jerk it, you'll get an instant click. And by the way, when you reach the right torque, it clicks once. I had somebody strip out at one of the engines and, and it was three hundred something. Somebody, one of the students. Sorry if it was you. Stripped out a, uh, stripped something out. I'm like, oh, what'd you do? I'm like, well, I was expecting it to click. It does click, but I thought it would click like a lot. And I'm like, well, no, it doesn't have. It just goes click, click once. It's a, it's a breakaway, so you do it. It breaks, uh, the spring and this little the spring and a ball inside of it. And when you reach the right torque, that that ball and spring break away, and so it does one click, and then you let go and it clicks back. So that's two. So uh, the downside to click, there are some torques that tell you to apply the torque and hold it for a certain period of time. Can't do that with the click. You have to do it with a dial. So that's the upside of a dial is you can put torque on and hold, but I feel it's harder to get in there and, and uh, sometimes, especially on larger torques where you're trying to really fight, you know, engine 600 inch pounds and up, it's hard to get your face in there and read it sideways while you're trying to pull it. Um, so th there's the bar type. The, oops, bar type. Bar, bar type is cool. That's old school. Um, and the great thing about the bar type... Uh, it comes with beer. Huh? It comes with beer. It does not. I think I have one in my office, but I'm not going to go grab it. It does. It has the little... So, all right. So there's the click type. Uh, there. There's the, there's the bar type. And what happens is as you pull the handle, that this green line here, this stays put and the rest of it bends so it tells you how much force you're putting on it. But here's what's neat about this. Okay, it's the fulcrum point. So right here is this little fulcrum thing and it teaches you how to properly torque. So here it is right here, this little pin. So the handle actually pivots on this little pin. And so your job is to hold this handle in such a way that so you have the bar goes inside and then the handle can actually go back and forth and hit the bar. Your job is to not let the handle hit the bar. It's like a little game. And as long as you're doing that, you're actually holding it properly and pulling it correctly. Because if you start twisting it, you're adding, you're adding torque to what is not really there. You're kind of tricking the machine. So it teaches you how to do it correctly, which I think is kind of cool. And last, uh, this is the one I have right here. This, and they don't even make them anymore. In fact, I brought it in and James was like, dude, that is so cool. And I'm like, I know, we should get a bunch of these. And so he went online and they discontinued them, which is too bad because it is really a very accurate little machine. And it just uses a transducer. Uh, so you put your socket on one end and your wrench on the other. You don't need a special wrench or anything. And you just set it for, uh, to make a sound when you reach the proper torque or you can peak, yeah, peak torque. Uh, set it for max torque and do all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. How do you calibrate the bar type? Same way you calibrate anything. Um, well, you would do a calibration chart. The question is, how do I adjust it? And that I don't know. I don't think I've ever had to adjust one. I don't think you can. Not only yeah. you can, and I've never had to. <laughs> yeah. Um, these, all of ours need to be, be calibrated. These, uh, these can be a pain, but there's usually a, a plug down at this end where you can pop it out and there's a secondary uh, set screw in there. You can adjust that to, to make uh, this more accurate. So if you have a torque wrench of your own, I encourage you to bring it in when we do engines and I will help you adjust it and calibrate it and make sure that it works at least for class. So. Um, okay, so in aviation, I have a small quarter-inch drive, I have a medium-sized 3-8 drive, and I have a big, 
a big half inch. It's the one brand I would recommend never buying. It's, it was a Craftsman. It's not that it's not accurate. It's just the way that it works. It has a little window right here and you adjust the end and the right, the torque you're asking for shows up in a little window. Yeah, I hate those. Uh, problem is the grip and the window are all into one and if the grip rotates, it gives you the wrong indicating and that's what happened to mine. The grip started rotating and it would lie to you. Uh, not a good thing. All right, uh, almost break time. So, let me see. All torque wrenches. Must be calibrated. I'm just gonna say annually. That's just gonna solve that problem. So annually. I think 43.13 does say annually. When dropped, for some of you, that's going to be weekly. Uh, oh, as, when dropped, I'm going to put it be easy. There's, I've seen <coughs> somewhere where it says dropped or abused. Um, as per repair station. And I put that because a lot of you may go to work for a repair station. So if you're just an A&P, like I am right now, I'm just an A&P working on my plane or working on somebody else's plane, but I'm, I'm not a repair station, well, the rules can be a little bit less. So if you can find something that there's no law that says I have to have my torque wrench calibrated every year, then I can make it every year and a half or every two years. I can make it every six months if I want it. If I'm working for a repair station, which I did, then you have an off-spec manual that will clearly define in there that says all torque wrenches must be calibrated annually. Well, now it's a law because the FAA approves that manual and that's the manual and the FAA comes in and says, let see your torque wrench. Well, Hawkman hasn't been calibrated you know, in, in the last year. And you're like, well, that's not really a law. I'm like, well, yeah, it really is because that's what your repair station manual says. So in order to be a repair station, you have to follow the manual and then you have to have that calibrated. Yeah. So even though you calibrated yours every time you changed torque, did you still calibrate it and sticker it annually? Yeah. So every year I got, you got the sticker. It just makes things nice and clean. So if somebody walked in and said, let me see your sticker, I can show up right there. It's been calibrated within the last year. And then, you know, if they watch me, say, well, what are you doing that for? I'm like, well, hey, that's how I do it. And you can um, keep doing it. It doesn't hurt anything. Oh, so I'm glad to say, how do you calibrate the calibrator? You actually know, though, don't you? Okay, so if you want to know, I can, uh, I can actually demonstrate it. But that machine, if you look down the floor, there's an orange box. It's very heavy, this box is very heavy. It weighs just a little over 150 pounds exactly. Inside of that machine are 50 pound weights that have been certified as 50 pound weights. And we would send those out and get them calibrated once a year by somebody else. And so the sticker, the sticker, I'll show, I've got it right back here. I don't want to run and get it. But it, it actually took the sticker off the machine. It said, our machine said, calibration due at each use. So every time we use that machine every morning, we would take and put, there's a rod you put on it, it's 10 inches exactly, and it's got a cable on it, and you would take and you'd put a 50 pound weight on, and 50 pound weight at 10 inches would give you, and I did math in my head real quick, uh, plus another five, would give you an exact weight. And then you'd put another 50 pound and another 50. So you'd have 150 pounds hanging on the machine, and you would just calibrate it in increments of 50 pounds. So that's how you do it. All right, let's stop there.